So it's my great pleasure to welcome Andrea Agazzi to today's uh, One World Seminar on the Mathematics of Machine Learning. And he's going to give a presentation on the convergence and optimality of wide neural networks for reinforcement learning. And we're very happy to have him. Andrea got his PhD in theoretical physics in 2017. And he is currently a Griffith Research Assistant Professor at Duke University. So yeah, I'm excited. Please, floor is yours. Thanks, Stefan, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you for, to the organizers for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today and to um, talk about my recent research on reinforcement learning that I carried out together with uh, John Fengbo. So um, before starting, perhaps a few a small forward. Um, so reinforcement learning, like many other sub-branches of machine learning, has received a lot of interest recently, uh, partly because of the success of uh, algorithms or models trained by these methods in planning, for example, the game of Go, um, uh, StarCraft, and, um, and robotic motion. Now, because of the size of the state spaces in, this, in these settings, it is um, unthinkable to obtain such uh, nice results without the combination of reinforcement learning with nonlinear function approximation, and in particular with uh, neural networks. Um, this has given rise to the so-called domain of uh, deep reinforcement learning. And um, despite its success, this, uh, the theoretical underpinning of these uh, of this, uh, achievements is uh, still uh, very poorly understood. So in this talk, what we would like to do is to discuss precisely this point. And in particular, we would like to uh, consider some prototypical examples of reinforcement learning algorithms and their interplay with the uh, with neural networks, in particular, focusing on convergence and optimality properties of um, of these models um, in some scaling regimes, when, for example, the um, width of the neural network is assumed to be large. Um, I should mention that these uh, these results are in close connection with a series of groundbreaking papers that appeared over the last few years. So during this talk, th these papers are mainly interested in the dynamics under in the uh, supervised learning uh, state or situation. So what I will try to do is I will try to connect um, these the results we uh, we obtained with those results and to highlight the differences between the two between the two settings. So let's make a start. I will start by introducing the uh, enforcement learning uh, problem. So um, reinforcement learning uh, concentrates on modeling and optimizing the interaction of uh, an agent uh, with the environment uh, around it. So the agent uh, will act on the environment in discrete time through a set of a certain set of actions, and the environment will respond to these actions by changing its state, its state accordingly, and by sending a reward to uh, to the uh, to the agent based on the action that it observed and the previous state. Um, the objective of reinforcement learning is to optimize this uh, interaction in a way that I will make more precise in a second. So um, this interaction is modeled in general as, as a, a, what is called the Markov decision process, which is composed of a state and an action space. So these states are, th these spaces are the sets where we will find the possible states of the environment, the possible actions of the uh, actor. We'll assume throughout this talk that these two spaces are compact. But differently from the uh, classical uh, reinforcement learning literature, we will not assume that they are fiscal, so they can be also continuous. The response of the environment to a certain action of the, uh, of the agent is modeled to a transition kernel P, which uh, takes uh, the previous state and the action of the, uh, of the agent and returns a certain distribution on the uh, state of the environment at the next time step. And together with the new uh, with the new state, the uh, environment will return a certain reward, which we'll assume throughout this talk again to be bounded, and which again takes a previous state and a certain action and returns a value in R, which is indeed this reward. So to uh, cement these ideas with a very simple example, we have the example of tic-tac-toe, right? Tic-tac-toe is a three by three grid. In each of the uh, positions, we can put either nothing or the signs of the two opponents. And uh, the actions, the possible actions of a certain agent are a subset of the positions of the grid, which can be indexed from one to nine. 
then uh, one can choose the reward the way he wants or they want, but uh, it is uh, a sensible choice to make to put a, a reward of one if the player wins and minus one if the player loses. Now, this is as far as the environment is concerned. Concerning the um, agent, the agent is usually modeled through its strategy of interaction with the environment. So this is represented by a certain policy which is a map that takes a state in the, the state space and maps it to a certain distribution of actions that the agent will perform on the, on the environment. So we know that both of these, the setting is a, a, a probabilistic or stochastic setting. It can be reduced to the deterministic setting. So a deterministic policy and a deterministic transi transition uh, by simply taking the delta function. So that's a special case of what we are considering here. Furthermore, we see that uh, by combining, so for a fixed policy pi, we can combine this policy together with the transition kernel to obtain an effective dynamics in, on, the, on the state space of the, of the problem, which is represented by the operator p pi. Right? So for a fixed policy, we'll have a, a, a determined dynamics on, on the state space. So please, by the way, I have not mentioned this, but uh, feel free to interrupt and unmute yourself in case you have questions uh, about the notation or anything else that is said in the, in the presentation. So um, as I anticipated, the objective of reinforcement learning is to optimize the interaction between the agent and the environment, which is, um, in other words, we want to maximize the sum of future rewards. And this quantity is captured by the so-called value function. So the value function is a map that takes a certain state S and maps it to the expected sum of future rewards under a certain policy pi, so under the dynamics induced by a certain policy pi, with initial condition given by the by the given initial state s. And so, in other words, this encodes how what is the expected future rewards in an infinite time horizon. We are going to restrict ourselves to this setting during this talk because of the infinite sum here. I want to discount the rewards as time increases in order to make sure that this sum is finite. And uh, we do this by a discount factor gamma, which is between zero and one, and essentially controls how far in the future we expect to obtain a certain reward during, uh, during our um, macro decision process, right? So the, the smaller the gamma, the closer in time we expect the reward to, to arrive. In general, what we really want to optimize of the objective function of the problem is given by the expectation of the value function for a given initial condition on the states of the, of the on the, of the environment. So a similar quantity to the value function is the state action value function. And this is a simple generalization. It simply means or, or captures the idea of fixing an initial state and an initial action and associating to it the uh, sum, the expected sum of future rewards under the dynamics of a fixed policy pi uh, by fixing the first state and the first action. So in other words, what these two functions capture is how good a certain state or a certain state and action is in terms of the objective uh, under a certain fixed policy pi. So these are two central quantities in uh, especially the value function in what follows. And as I have anticipated, our objective is going to be to improve the policy uh, in, uh, in various ways. So the, the strategy adopted to improve the policy with respect to the objective that I just outlined um, is, uh, or is reflected in different choices of algorithms in reinforcement learning. We can separate the uh, choices of these algorithms in two main families, depending on the essential step, essential approximation step performed by the algorithm. So there are essentially two doctrines. Why one of them is uh, called the value-based family of approaches. And um, this value-based family of approaches, as the name suggests, aims principally to approximate the Q function, which again encodes how good a state and an action are going to be under the policy pi. So fixes the policy and learns the value function, and then aims to update the policy based on this, um, on this quantity which we have, uh, we have learned. Right? So examples of, this, um, of these approaches are, called, uh, for example, Q-learning or policy iteration, in which um, the update for the policy is uh, extremely simple. In the greedy case here, we are simply choosing the policy as the, that action that maximizes the Q function. Again, the Q function is the quality of a certain state and action, and we want to maximize that in a, in a greedy way. So in contrast to this family of approaches, which aims to approximate the value function and learn the policy based on that, 
Another family of approaches aims to directly parameterize or approximate the policy, so to a certain parameter family, for example, and then to evolve the policy or the parameters of this uh, policy as to optimize the uh, objective function of choice. We are not going to discuss during this talk uh, which one of these two approaches is better and in which situation. Instead, what we aim to do is to give some prototypical examples of each of these two uh, approaches and then to discuss the performance of neural networks in the two, in the two situations. Okay, so we'll start with the first family of approaches. Remember, these are value-based value approaches and um, aim to approximate the value function for a fixed policy pi. Um, in this case, what we want to approximate, uh, I'm going to discuss the approximation of the simple state value function. The state action value function follows the same rules and the same uh, idea. So to simplify notation, we'll st stick to this situation. So from now on, I will try to, for a fixed policy pi, learn the value function. The immediate way of doing this is by approximating the value function with a um, with a Monte Carlo sampling. So sampling the trajectories induced by the policy pi and then performing an empirical average over those trajectories. Now this um, is, a, is a good method when the state space is small, but uh, it becomes increasingly bad for uh, large state spaces, which is the kind of state spaces we are interested in. So to do um, to perform this approximation, we should do uh, something a little more ingenious. So and a step in this direction is to re-express the value function, which is an infinite sum of rewards, as we see here, by isolating the first um, the first reward and then uh, expressing the uh, resulting or the remaining terms in the sum as an infinite sum, which in turn can be represented as the value function itself. So this is the, by the very definition of the value function. This allows us to express the value function as a function of itself, or in other words, to express the value function of the problem, the actual value function, the star, as the fixed point of the so-called Bellman operator. This Bellman operator can, of course, be applied to any approximation of the value function. And because we are talking about approximation and fixed points, the natural question is to ask whether this operator is a contraction. The answer to the question is yes. So this operator is indeed a contraction in the, in the convenient norm, which is the L2 norm with respect to the invariant measure induced by on, on state space, induced by the process uh, or the transition kernel P pi, which uh, we'll assume uh, for the remainder of this uh, part of the talk to be uh, unique and to have full support. Um, so in, in other words, because of these contraction properties, we can look at the application of the Bellman operator to an approximate value function as a proxy of the actual value function. And based on this intuition, we can therefore define an update uh, for an approximate value function um, to, as an incremental update in the direction pointed to at, but by the, um, by the Bellman operator. Right? So this is a, a, a essentially a an infinitesimal step in the direction that this uh, operator points to, and this is called the temporal difference uh, learning algorithm. So this is a, a, an update in function space, as we can see here. So it works well, and in fact, it contracts and converges in the case of uh, low dimensional function spaces, but it can be prohibitive as an update in the in large dimensional function spaces. So one, what one should do is we should parameterize the value function uh, with, in a certain, uh, with a certain model, and then update the parameters of this model according to this, to this update. And the natural way to do so is simply to project uh, the temporal difference update in, onto the space of parameter with the Jacobian of the map of interest, which is this quantity here. Now, the projection, of course, needs a, a, an inner product to be defined. And the inner product we define, we use is the one induced by the L2 norm with respect to the uh, invariant measure, which is the natural norm in this case. Now, I should make some remarks before moving on. Uh, in this talk, we would consider the idealized case where the time is a continuous variable. So the uh, time step is infinitesimally small and that the expectation is exact. Um, this is, of course, a law of large number or a population update. Um, the more realistic situation where this is an estimate will, uh, can be treated by applying stochastic approximation results to, to the law of large numbers that we will essentially derive. 
Furthermore, to um, establish a connection for those of you who are more familiar with supervised learning, by substituting this um, proxy for the actual value function with the value function itself, we see that this update is nothing else than the um, gradient descent update for the mean square error. Right? So, so, so this is a similar, uh, a similar update. So the difference here is that instead of using the actual value function, we use a proxy for it. And this proxy may uh, induce some, um, some uh, differences in this algorithm. For, for example, in the fact that this is not a gradient update or a gradient based algorithm, except in the case where the parameter, oh sorry, with the kernel is detail balanced. And, and this fact, the fact that this is not a gradient descent update um, can interact in a bad way with the uh, parameterization of the model as we can see in the following example. So the following example represents uh, the Hilbert space of approximating functions on a state space of size two. So the functions on this space are two dimensional vectors and the, lev the uh, vector field lines in this, in this plot are simply the updates in function space of the temporal difference learning algorithm. So you see that this is not a gradient algorithm. It has a rotational component to it, but it's still a contraction with respect to the Euclidean norm in this, in this state. So um, in general, the algorithm will converge. However, if we take a very nonlinear model and we try to learn this model with this algorithm, we see, for example, in this case, the spiral is this nonlinear model. And if we project the update given by the in function space by this algorithm on the spiral, we'll observe that the uh, update will point in the outward direction so that the, um, the, yeah, the update on, of the, for the model will diverge as time uh, goes to infinity. And so this is of course a very problematic situation uh, given by the interaction between the non-linear, so the non-gradient dynamics of this model and the um, non-linear nature of the, of the uh, model of, of, uh, of interest in this case. So the question now, of course, is whether this applies to the setting of neural networks. And um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to consider this question uh, by looking at a certain rescaling of the approximate value function in, in, uh, in this setting. So this rescaling, of course, um, will have a connection with neural networks. This connection has been established in this groundbreaking paper by Shizar, Bach, and Oyalon. Um, I will, I will elucidate or try to sketch this connection later, but, uh, but to keep close to the original counterexample, I will try to discuss this, the effect of this scaling as a scaling of independent interest and then go to the connection with neural networks. So if you now consider this scaling, um, we'll look, we'll see that uh, inserting this in the uh, parametric update for the temporal difference learning algorithm, we simply insert the rescaled value function instead of the original value function. Now, um, the difference that you can see in this case is this time rescaling one over alpha here. And this time rescaling in, uh, in the parametric update is done in such a way as to make the functional update, so the corresponding uh, functional update or the update of the rescaled model to be of order one. Indeed, we see that the alpha coming up here in front of the rescaled model simplifies with the one over alpha and by chain rule, we obtain uh, the update for the, for, the mod, for the corresponding model. And here's where we see the, uh, the role played by this alpha parameter. We see that it, it, uh, it has an effect on this model because while the, um, while the uh, approximator will change by an order one infinite amount of time, the parameters will change by one over alpha so that the parameters will move very little during training, giving the name uh, of this uh, rescaling of the value function as the lazy training. And consequently, and this is explained uh, much more in detail in this paper, consequently, uh, we'll uh, observe that the uh, kernel at initialization, uh, the, sorry, the kernel during the dynamics uh, will approximately be um, the kernel at initialization or the tangent kernel of the model at initialization. So that these dynamics will essentially behave like a fixed kernel method. And this is represented by the figure below where we see that the nonlinear model for increasing values of alpha will approximately behave like a linear model uh, that is tangent to the original model at initialization. And uh, this will help in the example that, in the counter example that we have seen before, and we see some intuition for this in this picture, this will help in the following way, because we are uh, rescaling the original model around the origin, right? And um, 
the fact that this model will approximately behave like a linear model will allow us to capture the contraction of this, of this uh, temporal difference learning dynamics. In other words, we'll destroy one of the two components that was inducing uh, explosion or, or divergence in this case, which was nonlinearity. And we are converging towards a linear model, which allow us to capture the convergence or the contraction of the original operator. This model will be a reproducing kernel in bird space um, asymptotically and tangent to the original model at initialization. Now to more concrete and, and, uh, and precise results. So if we define the norm uh, in the corresponding limiting reproducing kernel in bird space, which is the norm induced by the tangent kernel at initialization and uh, by pi zero, the projection with respect to the natural norm of the problem onto such, this, onto such uh, reproducing kernel in bird space and further assume that the initialization is such that the uh, initial uh, value function is scale invariant, what we obtain are two results depending on whether this uh, uh, tangent kernel is degenerate or not. We'll have that if the tangent kernel is non-degenerate, which can only happen when the uh, number of parameters is larger than the number of, of uh, um, states in the state space, we will be in the so-called over-parameterized regime. And we can show exponential convergence to the optimal value function. So the approximate value function will converge exponentially fast um, to the optimal value function where the rate of convergence depends on gamma. And is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, I will highlight how this depends on gamma in a second. In the underparameterized case, however, we can only hope for convergence to a local um, minimizer or a, a fixed point of the dynamics, uh, which will not necessarily be the optimal fixed point. As we see in this counterexample here, the optimal fixed point doesn't lie on the asymptotically um, reproducing kernel in that space, and therefore we cannot hope for global optimality. We can instead only hope for local optimality and quantify the error between the uh, local fixed point and the uh, value function by the distance between the projection of the actual value function and the uh, fixed point of interest. Good, so I will, I will spend a few minutes now uh, before moving on, uh, on to sketch quickly the proof of the over-parameterized result. As I have uh, anticipated uh, previously, we uh, don't have the gradient structure in this case and the convexity of the risk function that is used uh, in the supervised learning case to prove this exponential convergence. So we have to fall back on a slightly weaker formulation, which is the uh, formulation by uh, the Apunov function. So, we'll define the following the Apunov function, which is the uh, squared norm with respect to the reproducing kernel in space. I will reproduce the proof in the over-parameterized case uh, for simplicity. And um, what I want to show is that the time derivative of this uh, the Apunov function will decay with a rate along the trajectories of induced by the dynamics with a rate that is proportional um, to the Lyapunov function itself by a negative factor. So the way this proof uh, proceeds is by simply applying the derivative to this Lyapunov function and um, applying by chain rule, we have the first term from the norm, then the kernel, as we have seen before, this diagonal operator is simply the uh, operator representing the expectation with respect to the natural measure mu. And then we have what is called the temporal difference um, error uh, that quantifies the error between the, um, the approximate value function and the, and the proxy of the optimal value function. So if we, if we now um, use the fact that this kernel here is approximately constant at initialization up to a certain cost of one over alpha, we will uh, simplify this uh, approximation of the inverse of the, um, um, of the metric tensor with respect to this uh, metric. And therefore this will simplify and the metric will become the metric with respect to the natural measure. And this will allow us then to separate this scalar product and to leverage the contraction by a factor gamma of the, um, of the uh, uh, Bellman operator. So that what we obtain is at the right hand side, uh, we can bound this uh, variation up to a certain correction factor alpha uh, by a negative, um, a negative value times the uh, squared mu norm of the, uh, of the error or the distance between the approximate value function and the true value function. And so finally, uh, by equivalence of the norm, by overparameterization in this case, by equivalence of the reproducing kernel in the space norm and the uh, mu norm that we have observed, we will end up having um, 
the right hand side up to a factor k kappa squared, which is the equivalence constant between the two norms, we will have uh, the Lyapunov function itself so that we have shown exponential convergence. Okay, so now it's, uh, I think it's a good time to connect this discussion on lazy training regime to the situation that we encounter uh, training neural networks. So the class of neural networks that we will consider during this talk are um, single layer neural networks of width n. In particular, we'll represent the value function as a neural network that is obtained by um, averaging the output of the various neurons. And the output of the neurons is obtained by multiplying the weights of the last layer to the nonlinearity applied to um, a combination of the state and the weight of the first layer. So this representation will allow us to uh, separate the um, param parameter vector into n identical copies of the weights of the neurons. And these identical copies will live on a lower dimensional space theta and can be decomposed into the weight of the first layer and the weight of, uh, sorry, and the weight of the last layer and the weight of the first layer. This parameterization was, uh, in, I mean, was used in a series of uh, recent results on the dynamics of uh, neural networks. I have listed some of them here and I apologize if I have forgotten some of others because there is a very, very long list that has appeared uh, since, since these results appear. We will assume uh, in this talk that the uh, parameters are initialized IID with respect to a certain common distribution and that the uh, nonlinearity is a Lipschitz smooth activation function that is bounded and bounded derivative. So for example, we'll have, um, we'll have the sigmoid activation function and uh, we may have um, uh, some, for example, uh, soft max or, um, or tan age activation function uh, satisfy the conditions of, this, of these assumptions. RILU does not satisfy these conditions, but uh, Stefan has recently uh, published a paper that uh, discusses precisely the extension of similar results to the one I will present in a second to that framework. So there is hope that similar results can apply to that setting. Great, so it's now time to, uh, to make the connection between neural networks and the scaling and the results that I, that I presented before in the, in the lazy training regime. So this connection is made very clear in, the, in this uh, groundbreaking paper that I, uh, that I uh, mentioned before. So I will only make a formal connection here and I will refer to that paper for, for more information. So it turns out that this uh, connection is based on the uh, scaling of the initialization of the weights on the last layer for a single layer neural network. Uh, and in particular on the scaling of the variance of the uh, distribution of these weights at initialization with n. So for example, if we take uh, an uh, this model and we initialize its weight with a variance that is linear in n, what we obtain is uh, we can represent the same model by extracting so a scaling of the uh, random variables for the weights of the first layer and um, initializing the corresponding weights as theta tilde, which instead are uh, initialized with a um, scaling variant distribution. So the scaling to uh, bring, back, bring us back to this distribution is the scaling alpha n that we observe in front of this model. And alpha n in this case is simply square root of so at least on a formal level, what we have seen here is that um, the, uh, this scaling initialization, which by the way occurs uh, in classical or well widespread initializations of neural networks like the Xavier initialization, um, brings the uh, neural network to be in a regime which is uh, consistent or is, is the same regime as we had observed um, in, the, in the lazy training, uh, for the lazy training results. So, Initializing by Xavier initialization results in the network behaving in the lazy, tra lazy training or otherwise called neural tangent kernel uh, regime. And the, the kernel in this, in this setting is given by the expression given below and it's relatively, uh, it's relatively explicit in this case. So in other words, we see that uh, under a certain choice of initialization, neural networks will behave like a linear model approximately. And um, and that the results that we have obtained so far apply to, uh, to the setting of neural networks quite directly. These results, uh, I mean, the connection I have made is to a parameter alpha, but a more direct connection in some sense has been made in other, in, in other results where 
uh, the, the discussion was uh, led by simply considering this initialization of the parameters and performing the analysis independently on the parameter uh, alpha of the lazy training machine. Now, this initialization and these results uh, concerning local or global optimality of the convergence of the dynamics can be uh, compared with results uh, about the dynamics of neural networks in an alternative regime, which is the regime where the parameters of the last layer anti initialization scale in a, an independent way at, at, uh, with uh, n, like, like in this case. This scaling initialization, uh, the scaling at initialization induces the so-called mean field regime. This is the object of another series of papers that uh, I will reference in a second. And what we're going to discuss in the remaining of the talk is uh, the behavior of neural networks in this training regime in the temporal difference learning uh, algorithm. And we will compare them with the results in the lazy training regime. So, um, Let's uh, proceed and we can consider in the, mean, in the mean field regime, the key assumption or the key uh, remark that the authors make is that the uh, model as we see represented here is invariant under the permutation of the indices of the neurons. We see that the output of this expression is the same if we change the values of two i and j's. And um, as such, it makes sense to uh, model the state of the parameters of the state of the model as a quantity that reflects this, uh, this symmetry. This quantity uh, is chosen to be the empirical measure on the uh, parameters of the model, which lives on the probabilities, probability measures on the uh, state of uh, weights of the network. And then the value function approximation in this case uh, can be represented simply as in by integrating the nonlinearity of the model against this empirical measure. One then wants to model the corresponding dynamics uh, of these models. And the way uh, one can do that is by realizing that the uh, temporal difference learning dynamics um, is essentially the evolution of the particles representing the weights of the neurons along the lines of a certain, uh, of a certain vector field, which is the right-hand side of the uh, uh, temporal difference update. And that the evolution for the corresponding empirical measure can be captured by uh, the corresponding transport equation, which is what is represented here up to a certain rescaling of time. We see indeed this is exactly the same expression. What I've realized here is that applying this gradient to the to this sum only acts on one of these terms. So what, uh, what you will observe is simply the, uh, the application or the action of this gradient on one of these non-neural nonlinearities. And what we obtain is therefore that the evolution of the empirical measure is governed by a transport of Vlasov partial differential equation, uh, which has the form indicated below and for which the ordinary differential equations on top are simply the characteristic lines. This is a realization that was made in this uh, series of uh, papers. Um, and what we would like to do is now to study the evolution of this uh, partial differential equation to observe some properties of the neural networks in this region. What I should also mention uh, is that in this case, the dynamics is very nonlinear in the measure because of the dependence of the value function on the measure itself. And therefore, we, we are in a regime that behaves qualitatively very differently from the lazy regime, which instead was a linear, linear regime, as we have seen before. So the first thing we would like to do is to connect the dynamics of the, uh, of the neural network to the dynamics of the PDE. So what, because the dynamics of the PDE can evolve also uh, measures that are absolutely continuous with respect to the, um, to the Lebesgue measure. Instead, the state of a neural network is a set of, uh, of delta, so it's an empirical measure, and we would like to connect the two things. And this is done in the, uh, in the following partial results, which uh, says that uh, for a neural network of sufficient width, so if n is large enough, and the initial condition, the empirical measure of the initial condition of the parameters converges towards a fixed um, measure with finite second moments. This can be the case, for example, by sampling the parameters of the networks according to um, the limiting measure nu zero uh, IID. Then um, the push forward of the two measures, the state of the neural network and the limiting uh, measure of the parameters is still closed for every finite time in the sense that we have convergence of the measure being pushed forward in time towards the um, limiting measure being pushed forward in time. And this establishes a connection between the dynamics of the neural network and the dynamics of the, of the PD. So um, we would like to use this now to infer some of the properties of neural networks in this setting. 
And to do so, we will consider in particular um, the optimality properties of the network. So what we want to look at is the fixed points of uh, these dynamics and infer whether these fixed points correspond to optimal solutions of the, of the problem, or in other words, if the approximate value function corresponds to the actual value function of the given points. Now to observe, um, to observe fixed points, so the fixed point, we consider the fixed point equation corresponding to the transport equation of interest. And uh, by rephrasing the equation, I simply here represented the expectation uh, as an integral and extracted all the quantities that are independent on, on S, which is being integrated, we see that we can have a fixed point in multiple different ways. The first way of obtaining a fixed point is by having that the temporal difference error term is equal to zero. And this would be a very beneficial situation because in this case, we know that we have approximated the optimal, uh, the optimal value function, the actual value function, and we have converged by the contraction properties of the operator T, T gamma. However, if this is not the case, we may still observe some fixed points of this equation because we may, we may have that the um, nonlinearity sigma here may be orthogonal for all values of theta bar to the, um, to the temporal difference error resulting in this integral being equal to zero and then therefore the equation being a fixed point despite the suboptimality of the, of the approximator. And another problem may arise when the measure nu loses support in those regions where the vector field on the right hand side are non zero. What we want to do is give sufficient conditions now in order for these two events not to occur. And uh, it turns out that this sufficient condition can be given by assuming, so the first condition is fixed essentially by assuming that the nonlinearity sigma has sufficient expressive power so that its span is dense in the corresponding L2 space so that we cannot observe orthogonality between these two terms. This is an immediate consequence of this assumption. And we also assuming sufficient support, well, by sufficient I mean a support that is essentially on a strip in parameter space uh, where the strip is constrained by two values of um, the parameter of the last layer and everywhere else in, param in, the, in the weights of the first layer. Then we can show that all the fixed points of these dynamics are optimal uh, optimal in, in, uh, in terms of the approximation of the value function. And um, so this is a result that was obtained uh, in a very similar fashion in the, um, in, the, uh, in the supervised learning setting. The difference with the supervised learning setting is that in this case, we don't have, um, we don't have a convex potential and a gradient structure for the dynamics. And the way we bypass this is by replacing the assumption on the convexity of the potential by assuming this sufficient expressivity of the, um, the nonlinearity. And uh, I will uh, repeat uh, very quickly the sketch, very quickly the proof obtained in this, in this paper uh, of this result. So the sufficient nonlinearity, uh, the sufficient expressivity of this nonlinearity will allow, will allow us to recognize that the first component of the transport vector field, which by the structure of the homogeneous structure of the nonlinearity simply results in the uh, nonlinearity itself. Um, of the of the first layer, um, can we can we can see through assuming that we are converging to a suboptimal fixed point, we can see through this suboptimal. We say, sorry, we can see through the nonlinearity and see the suboptimality. So that there is going to be because of the sufficient expressivity of the nonlinearity, certain region in phase space where the corresponding vector field is non-zero. Then we see if we assume that we are converging to a suboptimal fixed point uh, because of topological properties of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, dynamics, we can we know that the um, um, the measure pushed forward at time t still has a, a certain sufficient notion of full support, and therefore that we will have some measure in those regions where the vector field does not vanish. And then we conclude the argument by contradiction by saying, okay, so if we are assuming to converge to a suboptimal fixed point. By what I said before, we will have some measure in a region where the vector field is positive. This vector field will push the measure far away, um, and therefore we will escape the neighborhood of the uh, of the local minimum or the uh, or the suboptimal minimum. Therefore, contradicting the assumption of convergence to a local fixed point. This is how the proof works, and it's uh, up to this uh, this change in the assumption on the nonlinearity follows a scheme that was devised in this paper by Shizai and Bach in, in 2018. 
So to summarize this first part and uh, to almost conclude the, the talk, um, uh, so what we have seen is we have seen um, two regimes where neural networks perform well in, in, uh, in uh, reinforcement learning tasks. The first regime is the lazy training regime. And we have seen that in this regime, we have exponential convergence in the overparameterized setting during training to the global minimizer. So we have MSC going to zero exponentially fast, where the rate of this MSC going to zero depends on the uh, discount factor gamma. And the underparameterized case, we cannot hope for global optimality. We will have local optimality, um, as shown by this plot, where the projection of the temporal difference error goes to zero. So the dynamics will, uh, will approximately or converge to a fixed point, which is not necessarily optimal. This is, has to be contrasted with instead the mean field regime, which um, where the message is that although we are essentially under, possibly underparameterized, we still have convergence. So the fixed point of these dynamics are all optimal. And um, in contrast to this situation, however, the convergence to this point points is uh, taken as an assumption. So we see that we have convergence, but the convergence is a much um, much harder uh, situation or much harder um, property to prove in this setting. And in fact, even in the supervised setting, the, converge of the convergence of this model has only been, est been established in some particularly uh, regular or, or regularized situation, as far as I know, and, and so far. So this is still a, a very much open and interesting question in, in, this, in these situations. OK, so this concludes the section on, the, on temporal difference learning. We have seen the different initialization of the neural network will result in different properties of the models being learned. And um, the last five minutes of the talk, I will spend by discussing what happens in the policy-based uh, situation, which is um, a situation where instead of willing to uh, learn the value function, we instead want to learn the policy and improve on this policy to a choice of improvement scheme. So this is what I will do in the last few minutes of the talk. So um, in this setting, what I want to uh, consider is a slide is a regularized problem. So it's a problem where we are regularizing the rewards by the so-called entropy regularization. So we are adding to the uh, rewards uh, designed by the uh, engineer of the problem a certain regularization term. Um, this regularization term will uh, increase as soon as this policy assumes very low, um, very low values. So the, the measure is, uh, is small for a certain set and therefore encourages exploration of the, um, of the resulting algorithm. So we'll, we'll encourage the algorithm to explore some regions of phase space in such a way as to avoid the situation where the algorithm is focused on exploiting or exploitation. So maximizing the uh, reward in a certain region of phase space without knowing that in some other region of phase space, because of loss of support, essentially of the policy, there is going to be a better reward. So this is, this is the reason why this uh, regularization is put in place. The parameter tau controls the strength of this regularization and for tau equal to zero, we recover the problem that we had studied. Now, um, choosing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this form of regularization, the value function would be rewritten in this, in this form. So we're simply replacing the reward in, in this expression. And uh, we'll adopt the following algorithm, which is the most naive, in some sense, way to uh, maximize this, uh, the, reward, the future reward, which is by taking a gradient ascent step uh, in parameter space for a certain parameterization of the policy of the objective function. That so we study this, uh, this situation. Of course, one has to choose a parameterization of the policy in this, uh, in this case. The parameterization of choice uh, is going to be the uh, softmax parameterization in this case. Of course, we cannot use uh, a directly a neural network representation for the policy because we need this policy to be normalized and to be positive. So the softmax in this case is the um, function that we will decide to apply to a certain neural network to approximate uh, this policy. And the neural network that we chose to choose to use as, as the exponent in this uh, softmax function is simply a mean field neural network, which we, as we have seen before, can be expressed as uh, simply the empirical, so the integration against the empirical measure of the nonlinearity of the mean. So under this dynamics, we'll have that the, um, under this update, we'll have that the dynamics of the parameters of the model simply go the, follow the gradient ascent 
of this policy. And similar to, to what we have uh, established uh, before in the, in the temporal difference learning setting, we can write the corresponding transport equation for this setting um, uh, corresponding to the vector field or the flow of the vector field in the, in the other situation. Now, this differently from the, term, uh, from the temporal difference learning setting, this partial differential equation is a Wasserstein gradient flow because of the Wasserstein structure of the dynamics. Um, but still, there is a difference with respect to the uh, supervised learning setting, which is the fact that this um, energy function or this uh, objective function is a non-convex function even of the policy pi. So, so we cannot leverage convexity as was done in the supervised learning setting. Um, this is a non-convex function. It is not as bad as it sounds, in fact, because this uh, function is actually one point convex in the policy. Uh, but still, we would um, we may have uh, disruptive interference between uh, the this uh, one point convexity or non convexity and the parameterization of choice for the policy. So what we have to do is to reproduce the optimality results in this case, and uh, we do so in the following theorem, which I I would briefly sketch before concluding. Um, the following theorem says that the dynamics of the corresponding laws of of transport PDE for the state of the of the model. Um, so the, the fixed points of this of these dynamics are optimal upon assuming that the like in the temporal difference learning setting that the uh, support of the measure is sufficiently wide and that the uh, nonlinearity in this case is sufficiently expressive. And again, we have to use this uh, property of the uh, sufficient expressivity of the nonlinearity as opposed to the situation in the um, in the um, supervised learning setting because we lack uh, convexity of the of the risk function that was leveraged in that in that case to obtain these results okay so i think i uh, i would uh, better complete this talk so in if there are questions about this sketch of this uh, result i'm happy to give them in uh, offline so what we see uh, here numerically is similarly to the situation in the um in the uh, temporal difference learning setting that the error between the uh, optimal policy of the uh, objective of the optimal policy and the objective of the train policy decays um, as the training time goes to do infinity. Still, uh, similarly to what we had before, and I should stress this point, the convergence of this algorithm to a fixed point is made as an assumption in this theorem. So we have optimality, but in general, convergence is not is not a, is not proven by this by this result except upon choosing some stronger conditions uh, and this is very much an open question for, for future work so i'll conclude this talk uh, in in a, in a minute by summarizing the findings that uh, i was able to um, present so uh, what we have seen is that we have investigated the performance of neural networks in different training regimes both in value-based or in the temporal difference learning algorithm and for policy gradient algorithms. Uh, we have seen that this, depending on the initialization of the neural network or the scaling of the initialization of these neural networks in the limit of sufficiently wide, um, of sufficiently wide uh, neural networks, we will have that the um, algorithms will display convergence, but not necessarily optimality in the lazy training regime, which results, for example, in from the Xavier initialization of the weights. Um, while instead, or on the contrary, um, we will observe optimality of the uh, networks when initializing a different regime, which is the mean field regime, but we will not be able to observe any rates. And in fact, the convergence in this case has to be uh, assumed. And similar results will uh, have to, I mean, uh, have, uh, have been found in the policy gradient setting in the lazy regime. Uh, another paper has obtained this result and in the policy gradient uh, sorry, in the mean field regime, uh, this is what I have introduced uh, previously in the last five minutes of the talk. So to conclude, just laying out some open questions, we'll have, of course, the convergence of the mean field dynamics is a very interesting and still open question in the general case. Uh, it would be interesting to uh, extend these results to some uh, finite sample analysis or stochastic approximation around the law of large numbers that we have described. Extension to multi-layer neural networks is, of course, uh, a very much interesting and open uh, way road of research. And then there are a number of different uh, reinforcement learning algorithms that still would have to be dealt with explicitly if a necessity requires that. So uh, with this, I will conclude this talk and thank you again very much for 
就是感觉